So this workshop will cover the basic processes in Fiji. So the absolute most basic thing you can do is open an image. When you want to open an image, you can go file open. And so when I talk about doing steps, often it'll be in this nomenclature. Uh, or you can just drag a file and drop it onto that status bar and it should open automatically or it might have a pop-up for the bioformats uh, opener. You can also do image imports. So if you have, um, depending on the microscope, you might have a folder with 100 frames of data and you wanna load them all in so that you've got one file that you can slide through time. So you can do file import an image sequence and then it will um, do that and turn it into one stack. If you need to use the bioformats opener, uh, it's going to do a pop-up and bioformats is this open source project that's managed by the open microscopy environment group. Uh, so you can reference them as well. Um, and it contains all the readers. So this is probably an out of date list, but a lot of the files that it can read and you can see some brands coming out. So 3i Slidebook, Leica, uh, Nikon, Olympus, all of the main vendors contribute so that you can have uh, a readable file in these other programs like Fiji. So you get this thing called the bioformats import options window. And I would say most people just click okay and don't think anything more of it. Well, you can change what it does. So whether it auto scales on open, you can split the channels automatically. If you always do that step, you could do it there. If you have like a hundred series time points of data in one file and you really only want to open the first five to check oh was it the good movie or was it that kind of dodgy one you can change and tick this box specify range and it will open up another thing that says oh you've got one of a hundred which would you like and you can tell it oh, i want three to five and it will do it for you it's really nice when you hover over these things the information box updates it's pretty self-explanatory if you never do anything with that window and you always click OK, you can actually go in and turn it off. So if you go plugins, bioformats, bioformats configuration, um, and then formats tab, you can scroll through and find like um, Carl's Ice image, CZI, and tick windowless. And it won't come up anymore. And if you then go, oh, I need it this time, you can go in and untick that box again to reverse it. It can be quite useful. Um, if you want to do that importing an image sequence, well, then you'd go file, the import menu, image sequence, and you get this pop-up. And once you navigate to the data, sorry, you then get that pop-up. And it will say, oh, this folder has how many images? In this example, three. I want to start at image number one, but if you wanted to start at number two, put number two. If you had 100 images and you only want every fifth one, you could put in an increment for five whether you want to change the scale or if you need to apply um, little filters. So if you have all these images and they have CH1 and CH2 and you just want to import all of your channel one, you could put that in here and it would only open those ones. Whether you want to convert them on import, um, obviously you'd want to sort the names you know, numerically. Um, and virtual stacks are a thing where you don't have to load it into RAM. So virtual stacks will load it from the disk. Um, it's a useful tool when you have really big data. Uh, but as I said, we have these big powerful computers at IMB where you can use them and you can talk to facility staff if you need that. But it's all pretty self-explanatory. Once you've opened the image and you've done something, you then want to save it, right? So often you'll go file save as TIFF. That's the main one, uh, as we spoke about. It uh, will maintain dimensional information, so it'll be like a, a stack, mm -hmm. and it will store most of the readable image metadata. So if you open up an image from the confocal and then you save it as a TIFF, it's going to have like the scale, how many slices, what colors you're using. I'm not going to tell you like what objective you are using though. It will lose that information. You can save an image sequence. Uh, what this does is it spits it all out in 2D files. So say you've got a uh, um, dead stack and you want each slice in a separate file, you can save it that way. AVI is a little movie or a time lapse um, and it gives you some extra options with compression and frame rate. JPEG, it's quite lossy, you don't do it. Um, 
OME TIFF down the bottom is the open microscopy environment TIFF. It's suitable if you are using a Mero, which is the image database uh, system. Uh, and it stores a lot more of that metadata than just a normal TIFF. Um, and there is a option under the bioformats exporter to export back as the format. Uh, I generally don't advise that because you can end up overriding that raw data by accident and you don't want to do that. There's a whole heap of other ones you can kind of go through them in your own time. So the first step, everyone should have downloaded the uh, data sets. Sorry, it's a bit big, um, but these are the worked examples that we're going to go through. So for the first exercise, it's pretty basic. Um, there should be a bioformats image in the folder, and there should be a time-lapse series of data. So have a go at opening both of them. If you want, have a play with the bioformats uh, opener options and change them around. Um, and have a go at importing that sequence of 230 frames. Let's open up the file, play with it, close it, um, import the sequence and close it. Now I'll go through these examples in a minute or two. So in the first folder, import images, the bioformats example. We can open up one of these images. Uh, so I have that window list turned on by default on mine. So you can go plugins, bioformats, configuration, formats. Nice to see that I turn that off. Get the opener. And I get my image. You might go, that image is pretty boring. There are some beads right in the middle, a little thin layer. You can see as I go up and down through the stack that I can see which slice I'm on out of the 500 frames. Open the area scan image. That only has one channel as well. It's a Z stack. You can see that this one that came in is automatically displaying as green because it recognized that it was captured with Beloiden. That was 488. So bioformats will read which channels you used and try to apply lookup tables um, to it. It's quite helpful. And then if we go um, import image sequence, and I want to go to raw images. Now, sometimes uh, Fiji won't display anything here and there'll just be an empty folder. Um, it has some quirks sometimes depending on the operating system and file types that I've seen. Just click on one of the files and click open. And then you can see it's read that there's 230. Now, I know that these ones are quite small, so I'm going to make them 200%. So they should be twice as big. Um, and if I wanted, I could put in a filter. But I'm just going to go ahead and import that. And then we see the time series of it crawling around. All right. Hopefully, everyone got that. And I can come back to this. There is an answer slide. So um, I didn't put an answer slide for the bioformats because it's just open the file. Um, the import one shows you how to do it. And the answers are at the end of the PDF if you downloaded it from the website. Um, and I'll update the latest one from today's talk if there are any changes. Um, but yeah, so moving on, you've opened your image. And now you might want to do some things. So the really useful tool to open up almost every time you go to Fiji is the channels and colors tools. So under image color channels tools, there's uh, one of the little pop-up boxes look like this, and it lets you do um, really nice things. There is also other options under here, 
like split, merge, and arrange. So it splits the windows, arranges them uh, to make a new window. The channels tool is this little window box. And up the top, you have this drop down for the different view parameters. So whether you want a composite, so if you've got a three channel image, then it will have under composite all three turned on. And you can say, oh, I want to turn off my red channel and just look at the green and blue. And then you'd turn off or untick one and you'd see both of them. The color view mode under here will show you just a single channel, but with the lookup table applied. So if it's uh, channel two, it might be green. But if you were to use the grayscale option, then all of the channels will just appear as grayscale. And you can tick these on and off as tick boxes. Under the more button, you get some shortcuts to things like split, merge, um, and importantly, some lookup table shortcuts. So uh, you get red, green, and blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, uh, and grayscale. So if you wanted to quickly change one of your channels from being blue to grayscale, you could do that there rather than going up to the, the menus. So it's quite useful and you, I pretty much open it every time I go into Fiji. The other really important tool is to look at that histogram. So I mentioned in the first video that histograms tell you a lot about the data. Running them in Fiji uh, will also uh, have the same thing. It brings up information about the images and uh, you can use this information in later steps. So it's under analyze histogram and it just displays a new window for the histogram of whatever image you had open. If you have a multi-channel image, it will ask you by default run the histogram on all channels or the one that you're actively got that slider on. You don't want to do it on all channels because it just merges them. It doesn't actually treat it the way you think it would. So uh, the next bit that's also useful is merging channels. So some of our microscopes are quite manual in that you take a picture of the green channel and you turn it, the filter cube, and you take a picture of the red channel and you want to put them back together. Um, a lot of the modern ones will do that automatically, but for a lot of our systems, they can have a color camera or a monochrome camera, and you should know what their use cases are for, right? So color cameras are great for fluorescence, uh, for bright field imaging, but monochrome cameras are what we need to use for the fluorescent micrographs that we take. The reason this is important is if you take a red fluorescence channel image on a color camera, it'll appear red on the, the screen and the image that you take will have mostly red, but they're often quite leaky and you won't have all the information just stored in the red channel. You'll get some in the green pixels and some in the uh, blue pixels. But you know that if you're using a fluorescent microscope and you have that red filter cube in place, then only the red values should be coming through the camera. So what am I kind of waffling on about here? So this is some, a red stain of wheat germ in the kidney section. And it's captured as a color 24-bit image. It looks red, should be happy. But it should be a monochrome image of just 8-bit. And so if we split it out to the three channels, red, green, and blue, and I change the lookup table to something so that we can kind of see it a bit clearer, there's a lot of information in the red, right? As we expect. In the green channel though, we get counts as high as 20. So our maximum value detected was 20. That's almost a 10th of our dynamic range. And having that information there, if I was to merge that with another green channel, well, that's going to add to the green channel image. And then I haven't treated all things equally because I'm, if there was red there, then it would be contributing to that green channel. So you really want to only capture fluorescence images in grayscale mode or on a monochrome camera. Um, I can't stress that enough. It's really important. So, once you've captured proper monochrome grayscale images for your red, green, and blue, you want to merge them together. And in Fiji, under image, color, merge channels, you can load in your images and then say, this image is my red channel, this image is my green channel, and this image is my blue channel. 
And then you can have a number of options. So you can create a composite image. That's what you want to do. You don't want to make an RGB image. And do you want to keep the source images and open a new window or close them all and just have one? And do you want to ignore the source lookup tables? So if you don't tick that, you'll just get a three channel image that are all blank. So the second exercise is to open up these three images and then merge them together, doing that image merge, uh, image color merge. So I'll get everyone to quickly have a go at that. And leave the image open uh, because we're going to do the brightness adjustments and that with the same image. So So it's quite easy to open the files by dropping them on the status bar. Now I've named the file blue for the blue channel, red for the red channel, and green for the green channel. So under image, color, merge, or if I had that channels tool open, I could go more and merge channels as the little shortcut. And then I just need to tell it that the red channel, I want the red one, the green channel, I want the one ending in green, the one ending in blue. Now, you mightn't have that named for you automatically. So that's why it's important to know that 568 here is Floydon, 488 is Wheat German, blue channel is Daffy. Then I know that the order uh, that the files are taken are in that order. So that's a useful tip for the naming convention. And then you click OK and you get this new in window. It's got three channels. Let's get the top here. And I'm on composite mode, so I could turn on and off different versions of that. Or I could go to the single color mode, select them, or scroll through, or use the slider. Or I could also look at the grayscale because sometimes it can be difficult to see the detail in like the blue channel. Uh, because our eyes can't see blue as well. So we'll bring those back up. All right, I'm going to leave that open, go back to the PowerPoint, and we'll keep going because the next slides go through how to adjust the settings. So the answer slide's there, um, and it will be uh, in the power, uh, PDF at the end as well. The the next thing is that image is, it's okay, but it's not really uh, aesthetically pleasing to look at, or it might be quite dim when we go to put it in our figure for publications. So you might need to adjust the display brightness and contrast. Now, when you capture the image, it's important not to overexpose or saturate because we'll lose that information, as I said earlier. But it's better to adjust the brightness up afterwards than it is to have these saturated images and you can't go back down. But you have to remember that your adjustments should be reproducible and that they must be equal. So in ImageJ, there's the adjustments menu. So image adjust and you get all of these options. Most of them, like most things in Fiji or ImageJ, are pretty self-explanatory. The brightness and contrast, it allows you to change the pixel intensity, the display pixel intensity values uh, of your image. Window level is similar to brightness contrast. You can do thresholding, which is in the second workshop, which is up on YouTube. Uh, color thresholding, if you have RGB images, you can change the canvas size, things like that if you need to. But the main one is that people are going to always do is adjust the display brightness and contrast. And for that, you need to look at the histogram. So we take our images, our red channel, our green channel, and our blue channel, and we want to do a histogram on each of them. And we can see the minimum value and the maximum value. And you can see that for each channel, it varies. Now, what I adjust my blue channel by doesn't matter or like if I increase this to 74, I don't have to do that for the other channels because my 
intensity of DAPI has no real bearing on my GFP signal. But if I'm going to say that my drug treatment or whatever that I'm comparing affects my DAPI stain, then I have to do it all equally, right? So you do that between images, but the same channel or channels in the same image don't have to be treated the same. But the reason we take the histogram is we want to open up the brightness of contrast window and you need to adjust at some point. Now, I would say most people that I deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis will go and grab the slider here and just drag it up to when it looks pretty. And that's not very scientific. And it's also not what you would write in your figure legend. No one will have a publication where it says, Images had their displays adjusted until I thought they looked good. What you should be doing is taking measurements of your data and displaying it accurately for the data that you've got. So you have these sliders under this menu and you can move them left or right, or you can apply values and the sliders apply to these values here. We have a histogram of our data, of some image. We can see that most of the data is kind of to the left here, it's in the lower range of numbers. It probably goes from something like 10 to 500. But if we're displaying everything out to 4,095, then a lot of the image will be dark because we have to equally show all of this range. If we move the minimum slider so that we say that the minimum thing that we're gonna display is around here, which is the 10 value, then you're not showing anything below that. And it, if you slide the maximum value to where you want the maximum displayed value to be shown as is something around 500, then it would be uh, you know, a slider from here to here. If you move these sliders, the minimum and maximum, it's the same as moving the brightness and contrast and they will adjust accordingly. So these are kind of linked to one another. And there's these buttons down the bottom that you can click auto. And by default, it's going to set saturation to 30%. If you reset, then it will go back to the full dynamic range of your image that it read from the metadata. If you click set, it brings up a window that lets you manually type in these numbers. And it has a nice little tip that lets you apply it to other windows. And if you click the apply button, it actually changes the values and it scales your image based on what you displayed. So you do want to be careful around the apply button. So what are the steps that you do? You've got your image and you go, here's my red channel. It's kind of dim, not really showing me much. So I want to find out, well, the minimum value is four and the maximum value is 85. And of all the pixels here, that's the brightest thing and that's the dimmest thing. So I want to set my minimum range from four to 85 and then click okay. Now, if you click apply, it'll stretch that histogram. But this is just kind of showing you what it's doing uh, visually for you for the display mode. So it's just saying that instead of using the whole range here, we're going to apply it across that whole lookup all the way out to 255. You don't want to click apply because then it does go and change the numbers. Now you also might have your control and your treatment image and you want to have a look at both of them and figure out what numbers you use for one of them and then apply that to the other images. And that's where that set range has this little tick box that says propagate to all other open images. And this is contextual. So if you have a two channel image, it will say apply to all other channels of this image or all other three channel images, for example. So they are different, um, but that's what we're gonna do next. So, um, it's useful for visualizing um, and for making spatial claims. So if you're just gonna manually count things and you wanna click on the nuclei one by one, then you have to be able to see them to count them. So you should drag the scale up or the display adjustment up. Be careful when using the apply button because it changes the values. But if you're making a figure, then you wanna make sure that you set both displayed the same range and be taken into the uh, PowerPoint later or something, they'll be equal. But you do want to make sure when you do this that you have uh, a comment that says something like histograms are stretched equally for the dis for display purposes or, or adjusted for display purposes um, equally is the key term that you 
the, the editors and that will want to see. So should have Fiji open, should have that window still there. Um, now what we want to do is adjust the brightness and contrast. So you can either split it back out into three windows and take the histogram for each one, move the slider to channel one if you leave it in the multi-channel mode. When you go histogram, there'll be a pop-up that'll say uh, all channels or something along the lines of that. Click no, and then it will do it. Move to the second channel, run the histogram again, and get those numbers to then set the brightness and contrast. And that, remember, that's then you have a justifiable reason why you set that range. If anyone questions you, you can say, well, that's what it was. It wasn't, oh, I thought that would look pretty today. So. If we go analyze histogram, include all three images, no, by red, go to the green channel, green value. And I want to do it for the blue channel as well. And then if I go image, adjust, brightness, contrast, I can go set zero, change that to four, and my maximum 85. Now I don't want to apply that to the other two channels of this image, because as I said before, they have different, they have no bearing on each other. But if I had another three channel image open, it would apply that settings to just that channel of the three channel image. And then I can go to my green channel, get the histogram values, and set that from nine to 123. Ah, so because I still had this clicked, it adjusted that window. So I want to be careful to make sure that I've highlighted the window that it is open. And I want to set that one to nine. nine. And then lastly, bring up blue window. And I have seven to seventy four. Then I have an image where I can see everything a lot clearer than that raw image before. So that's what it kind of reset those ranges. That's what it looks before. So hopefully you can appreciate that's an improvement. And that's how you actually should adjust your images and not the, I just use the slider until it looks pretty, like what most people do. So importantly, if you have a multi-channel image, make sure you use that no button, use that set range to make it look, um, apply that look up display setting for you. Okay, there are some uh, rare occasions where you might need to change the bit depth of the image. So if you wanna check the bit depth, you go image type and it will be ticked, whether it was a 16 bit or an eight bit, it'll tell you at the top of the image as well. Um, but more often than not, you shouldn't really be changing the bit depth. Going from an 8-bit raw image and then just scaling up to 16-bit won't really give you any more information. Sometimes you do have to use a 32-bit image, but that's in some really specific cases. Um, the 8-bit color image and RGB image will apply the lookup table to the, the images and lock them in. RGB will convert it to the flattened RGB. Now, if you do change the scale, Fiji has a weird quirk. 
and you want to be aware of it. So under edit options conversions, turn off scaling when converting. So if you have an 8-bit image and you haven't reset the display range, it will apply the display range settings that you've got um, to the, when it stretches it to a 16-bit. So you just want to be careful uh, with that. The next thing uh, that often comes up and is important for all users to know how to do is to check or add scale to your images because you might want to add a scale bar. Most microscopes are going to have the pixel information and the size information stored in the metadata. So if you're getting off a confocal image or a image from uh, the Zeiss Apatome system we have where it's a CZI file, it's going to tell you, or tell Fiji, importantly, the scale. So it'll say each pixel is actually 104 nanometers. If you are using a more basic system, uh, or one of our older generic wide field systems, then you might only get TIFFs out, and they don't have scales stored in them. So you would have to then tell Fiji, or the program you're using, what the scale is, and set the scale. So if you go image and then image properties, you'll get a little window like this. And it will have how many channels you have, slices, etc. Down the bottom, it'll tell you uh, its unit of length. So at the moment, it's pixel and it has a width of one and height of one and voxel of one. No microscope is going to give you that. If it has unit of length micron and then a number that's not a whole number of one, then it's got scale. Um, the, the dead giveaway is the unit of length of pixels, it doesn't have scale. So when you don't have scale, you either need to talk to the facility staff and know what the pixel size is for the, that system at that magnification, or you can calibrate your images by taking a picture of a ruler. So we have special slides that have laser etched tiny rulers and we could take a picture of that and then we draw a line on it and say this line is 20 pixels, uh, you know, a, a known amount. So if I draw a line in this and then open up set scale under analyze set scale, it'll tell me that the line was 17 pixels long, but I'll tell it my known distance was one millimeter or whatever scale I'm using and then I'll tell it the input length. I can then click global and OK. If I click OK by itself, it'll apply that scale to that image. If I click global, it will apply that to all images open and every image that I keep opening until it comes across an image that has scale information. So it will throw up a warning and saying, hey, you're telling me that it's this scale, but the file's telling me it's that scale. What do you want? So it is smart enough to know that. But if you're working on lots of images that you took from one of the basic microscopes, the global button is your friend because it'll just keep applying that same scale. And then once you have scale, whether it was automatically from the file already or you set that scale using the manual way, you can add a scale bar because all publications require a scale bar. Um, in Fiji, you go analyze tools scale bar, you'll get a window like this, and it's really self-explanatory. You tell it how long you want it to be, so 10 microns wide, and the height, so how thick you want the line, what size font, if you're gonna have the writing on the image, what color, what, whether you wanna give it a background. So if you've got like a H&E image where there's like a tissue section and there's lots of things changing throughout the whole image, you might need to put like a white box behind it. Um, and then the location, so lower right, upper right, upper left, etc. If you draw a line before opening the scale bar window, it will try to place it at the spot that you drew the line. So uh, if you need it in some very specific orientation, you can do that. There are some tick boxes down here, bold, the text, maybe on a serif font. If you've got a Z stack or a time series, do you want to just label the first slice or all slices? So it's self-explanatory, you'd want to tick that. Do you want to hide the text? So most journals don't want the text in, on the image. They'll want it as 
bigger legend text. And the last one, overlay. It can be really important. If you've got a image that's got red, green, and blue, and you only want to add the scale to like the red channel, then when you add it as white, it will just add it as 255. And so with a red lookup table, your scale bar will appear red, even though you've told it to go white. But if you tick overlay, it will add it as an overlaid element and it will be the color that you tell it. So if you've got multi-channel images, you really want it to be white as an overlay. All right, so exercise four has um, two sets of images. One set has no scale, and there's a, an image in there where it's got a scale bar of, I think, 20 microns. And so you can open that image, draw the line over it, and then tell it settings, uh, the global settings of this is 20 microns. Open up the other image in that set, and then add the scale bar. And then the other set of images has scale because it's a, um, like a comparable image. So you can then add it automatically because it'll have the pixel size information stored there for you. So have a go at opening those, setting scale, and I'll walk through that example in a minute or two. So I've opened up the calibrated image that has a scale bar of 20 microns. I can zoom in on that scale bar and I can draw a line. Now if I hold shift, it'll lock it to be horizontal. And then I can go analyze set scale. Now the distance is 186 pixels, but the known distance is 20, 20 microns, because the unit of length is micron, and I'm going to click global. And it tells me that it's 9.3 pixels per micron, which is the scaling factor. Okay, so now if I open up this image, it'll have the scale information stored. I can go analyze, tools, scale bar, now, I don't want an eight micron scale bar, that's a bit weird. 10, I want to hide the text and I want to overlay it so that it's white. Done. Now, if I go back to the set B image, which is a MIP image with metadata, I get this warning. There's the calibration of this image conflicts with the current global calibration. Disable the global calibration. Now in this image, it has that scale automatically stored. If I wanted to check and confirm, I could go properties and see that it has microns and it's this number. It's 107 nanometers or 100.107 microns per pixel. Okay. And I can come in and go analyze tools, scale bar. If I wanted something very big, I could add that. Let's add a 20 micron scale bar. And if I don't do overlay this time, you can see that it's blue because it, this, this channel is the blue channel. So I want to make sure that I have that overlay on so that it remains white. And there we go. So that's how you add scale. And the answer slide again with, will be at the end of the PDF, but it shows you to open up the images, 
set the tool to line, draw over that scale bar on the calibrated one, set the scale to 20 microns, that's in the file name, um, and then add the scale bar. And you can save the TIFF out if you want. Likewise for set B, when you open it up, um, it's note the disable global calibration and also note that the use of overlay because this one's a multi-channel, whereas that was an RGB image. So. All right. Moving on uh, is the next stage. You might be using a system that has a 3D capability. So our system, the, the Zeiss Apatome, has a motorized stage. We have a Fluoro 4, our Nikon up, uh, invert microscope has a Z, uh, Z stage. And the confocals and the higher end equipment up in the facility also, of course, can take 3D images. So these next few slides go through how to deal with 3D images. We call it 3D images image stacks in Fiji. Um, they can be displayed spatially or temporally in a single window. So it makes it really nice to be able to scroll up and down and quickly view what's changing in the height of your cell or what's changing over time with the development of something. Um, yeah, so Fiji is really useful for viewing stacks. If you have a 3D image, it's made up of slices. And if you have a time series, it's made up of frames. You can do these things called virtual stacks. And as I mentioned earlier, they are disk resident. So instead of using up all your RAM, they just load from the hard drive. Now that's slower, but they are, um, you know, it increases the capability of your computer to opening up the, the files. Stacks are really useful for viewing series. So whether it's time, spatial, spectral information, you can just scroll through them, as I said. Hyperstacks is the term that's used for multi-dimensional stacks. So you might have a 3D series over time. And so you have a 4D data set, essentially. And stacks can be flattened or projected into a lower dimension. So if you have a 3D image, then you might want to flatten it to show uh, a uh, you know, maximum projection in your paper. It can be hard to show 3D in 2D papers when you print it out. And um, you can also save things out as GIFs or something to visualize those changes. Um, so there's, there's modifications you can do to stacks. The next few slides go through a series of things that you can do with stacks. So you can make a montage. You can go image stacks, make montage. And that allows the user to import um, dimensions as columns and rows over the image. So if you had a time series, or in this case, a Z stack, and you want to show every slice, you can do that by going columns and rows. And it will just make it for you with, based on the settings. It's all pretty obvious with the height, uh, the scale factor. So usually you have to shrink down because your images are quite big. Um, what the increment is and whether you want to put a little spacing or border between them, whether you want to label everyone and whether you want to use the foreground color, essentially your overlay option here. Um, and then click okay and it generates a new window for you. If you have um, image stacks, you can project them. That's called usually a Z projection under image stacks, Z project. Um, this flattens them down. So as I said at the beginning, your image is like an Excel spreadsheet of numbers. And then if you have a Z stack, it's just an array of numbers, array of numbers, array of numbers stacked one on each other. If you want to flatten it, then you can do that in a number of ways. You could take the average number. So if you were to go to pixel location one, one, at slice one, take the number, slice two, take the number, slice three, take the number, et cetera, and find the average. You make a new window with all of that information. You can find the maximum value. So you just go vertically through and find the brightest pixel. That's the one you keep for your new image. And you can find the minimum value, the sum, the standard deviation, the median value. So you can do all these different ways. When would you use them? Well, if you're quantifying things, the average or the sum is probably important. The sum is important quantifying if you have the same number of slices. Because 
if you have in one capture just twice as many slices, then it, you're going to get a number that's a lot bigger because you're adding more things together. The maximum value is really good for displaying fluorescent images by flattening them. And the minimum is really good for actually bright field images. So if you've captured uh, perhaps on the confocal, you have a TPMT or the transmitted light uh, detector, then you want to minimum project that channel and maximum project your fluorescence. Because in a bright field image, you have dark things on a white background. So you want to take the, you want to keep all the dark objects so you find the minimum values. Whereas fluorescence, we have white things on a dark background and we want to keep the white things or the bright things, so, or the gray values. So you want to increase seeing the brighter ones of them by taking the maximum values. So exercise five involves opening up some Z stacks and flattening them. And have a go at doing a couple of the different ones to see how they look and what you um, can achieve by displaying that 3D information as a flattened image. I'll give everyone a second to do that. In this image, we can see that, you know, just taking one slice wouldn't really show a lot of information. It's a fluorescent image because my background is black and my values, my cell is, uh, you know, increased. So up here on the status bar, you can see that they're, you know, 50, 20, background's three. So it's a bright thing on a uh, dark background. So I could perform a stack Z project. Now importantly, there is the image stacks menu, but there is a shortcut under the main menu called STK. I'm going to Z project, and I might do a max intensity. And then I can see the base of the cell or the outline and all these structures on the top. I can see that quite clearly. Now I could also do a sum and when I do a sum the output is a 32-bit image because it needs a bigger dynamic range to add all those values into otherwise it would just saturate out so that's one of the cases where you would see a 32-bit image uh, compared to a normal 8 or 16-bit image see so there's the two channels and if I look at that other channel then you know, now I can see the nuclei quite clearly. Okay, so that's Z projections. So we want to open the stack, um, Z project it by going to image stack Z projection and making sure we go our full slice values. Okay. Here I've just adjusted the brightness and contrast and I've given it the fire lookup table so that I can see all these structures quite clearly. Okay, another really useful tool is the reslice. So when you have your 3D Z stack and this one has 41 slices, again, maybe you don't want to flatten it and project it to show uh, in your publication, you might want to show that something is always on top of the cell or it's always in the nucleus or at a certain height. You can do what's called a reslice. So a reslice lets you draw a line anyway in the image, and then it will take along that line a new image where it displays the y axis, sorry, the x axis of that image as the line. And then the Z axis of this image is the Z axis of the uh, Z stack. So if you imagine we've cut this in half and then we're looking side on at a single line vertically cut through our image. 
So that can be really useful. As a tip, always draw your lines from left to right because it can get really confusing when you draw it the other way because your image here would be flipped. But it gives you a cross-sectional view of XY through the image, XZ through the image. And then by this time, you might have a few windows open. If you've not been closing things, you can hit the enter button or the return button and it brings that main Fiji status window straight up to the top. It can be really useful. When we do that um, re-slice mode, you can also do an orthogonal view where it doesn't quite let you draw the line any which direction, but it gives you a horizontal and vertical or X and Y re-slice window. And so this lets you, this is a very classic way of showing uh, 3D information for publication. So you can move this center cursor around and the horizontal line here will be displayed as an XZ image. And then the vertical line will be a YZ image representation. So this is the Y axis, that's the X axis. And then the Z axis is the slider or uh, vertically or horizontally in these extra windows. The outer windows, so the YZ and the XZ have this line and that's what will be shown in the center XY window. So you can get all three axes visible uh, of an object. So I've used this in the past where I'm trying to show that this particular endosome has certain markers and you want to show in all axes that it's overlapping and you have um, co-localization. Or perhaps you've got like a cell where it's eating something and you want to see what's surrounding that something. So that's another way. Uh, it's really useful for showing 3D information on a 2D kind of printout figure in a paper or on a PowerPoint slide. The other neat tool that you can use to show 3D information is to literally have a 3D rotating around in a projection. So obviously you can't do that in your publication, but for a talk, you can have an animation of your um, object in 3D kind of volume view space. So under image stack 3D project, you can open up uh, a tool window that lets you make that kind of 3D data set. Now, obviously in our facility, we have commercial programs like Amaris, Arevis to do that uh, in a more high throughput way. Um, but you can use this way um, to create an image or a movie. Uh, and this is the freeway. So the projection method is usually brightest point so that you find the maximum objects. If it's a 3D bright field, then you'd want to use the minimum point. Um, the axis of rotation, so whether you want to rotate around the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z axis, is um, options there. And then the slice spacing, so it should pull that from the metadata. Um, and then obviously it starts at zero. And if you want to do like 360 degrees and you want to go in 10 uh, degree increments, so you'd have 36 images. Um, if you do like one and then you have 360 images, it's going to take a long time to render all of those positions. So keep that in mind. Um, and then the main one that you really want to play with is do you interpolate or not? So interpolating is just essentially filling in the gaps. So in Fiji, it will display them as slices, but perhaps you need to uh, join the gaps basically. So I have an example for this. We've got this two cell movies and the one on the right, which knowingly played first is interpolated and this one is not. So if we stop it at that side point, you can see the individual slice information versus it's interpolated, it's all merged, and it looks quite pretty. So um, this is the visualizing, this is the quantifying, not that you'd really quantify this. All right, now you get the chance to make your own 3D projection. If you open up uh, exercise six's files, 
and one of the files. I think I've got a cell and a fish. And try one of the 3D rotations so that it uh, does a projection for you. You can play with the lookup table. Importantly, you don't want your image to be too bright and saturated because it takes the display settings as the input display settings and that the maxima is defined. So if it's really bright, then your image will look really saturated just as a heads up. I'm going to open up this stack, which is a fish. which definitely doesn't look very good as a single slice. Now I could do that Z projection. That gives me a bit of an idea about it. But I can also do a 3D projection. And So on that status bar, you can see that there's something happening and it is not very fast. If you wanted to make complex uh, 3D animations, there is certainly other software and there are plugins in Fiji that can do that. Okay. So yes, that's the, the image. If you want to change the lookup table, there's uh, the shortcut here to all different lookup tables. You can look at what the different ones do. There you go. And then you could output this as an API, for example. And you can have that rotating on your title slide or something. It can be quite useful. Okay. Again, we've got the answer slide. Now, this time I've got the fish rotating around the x-axis, not the y-axis. Um, but yeah, you can do the, the different settings and you can change the lookup table if you want. All right. So lastly, uh, we'll go through some stuff on how to get some quantification on your images. Um, there is a intermediate Fiji workshop that's also going to will be posted on YouTube um, that has a bit more detail on more advanced quantifications. This is just to get you the toe in the water. Um, as I said at the very, very beginning, not only can a picture be qualitative and be pretty, but it can be quantitative, provided you've captured it all equally and properly. And in Fiji, you can do lots of different types of quantifications. Common ones include measuring fluorescence. Um, so that's descriptor stuff. It has an intensity of this. Um, you know, intensity increased this much relative to control. You can use images to count objects. So whether it's a nuclei, an endosome, a cell, a bacteria, a crystal, a grain of sand, anything can be kind of turned into a blob and then counted. And you can use it to describe things. So how long is the object that you found? What's the area of the objects that you found? Are they changing? So if you've got lots of cells, does some drug make them swell up? Does it make them shrink down and die? All different things can be described. You can also look at like how round an object is or how elliptical. So if you had a mixed population of bacteria, you could find the cocci ones and the rod ones. Um, you can do descriptor-based stuff. You can measure changes in intensity. So for things like FRAP, where you bleach an area and then you measure the intensity coming back. Localized enrichment. So over time, does your you know, label go to the surface of the cell or something? Is it the uptake? So is, is your um, object of interest taking up a molecule that you've labeled? And you can perform ratiometric uh, imaging and quantification. So things like FRET, where you want to find the 
uh, fret and the donor and divide one by the other and things like that, uh, or for color equalization. So you can mask with one channel and and then say, is that object there in that same area and perform like divisional stuff. That's all possible in Fiji. But all of this stuff requires specific controls and equal imaging conditions for all of your acquisitions. That's really, really important. So to make a measurement, you'll probably need a selection because you probably don't want to just take it on the whole image. You want to kind of draw around your cell or something. And so I said at the beginning, there's those pretty manual kind of selections where you can draw a square or a circle, segmented lines, freehand lines. You can manually do a whole heap. Um, you can have it generated by code or by the program itself using something like thresholding to generate uh, area or like that magic wand selection tool. Uh, once you've got a selection, you can edit it under edit selection. And so if you have this original shape, then maybe you want to kind of fit a curved uh, outline, fit a circle around that same shape, um, fit the ellipse, inverses, so you can select everywhere that you didn't select, create a mask from it, etc. So there's all these little tools that you can use to quickly expand on your selection. Uh, make inverse can be quite useful for making masks and things like that. All right, if you've drawn very carefully around a cell and then you accidentally click away or you bump something and it all disappears, generally you can go Command or Control Shift E and it restores that selection. If I'd known that early on when I was manually tracing hundreds of cells, be very thankful. That's a nice tool or feature. Okay, you've got your selection, you've got your image open and now you wanna do some measurements. Well, you have to tell Fiji what measurements to do because there are quite a few. So if you go analyze set measurements, you'll get a pop-up that looks like this. And this is just some of the measurements that you can do. So min and max, pretty obvious. Um, the center of mass, the bounding rectangle, shape descriptors, that's quite useful for how circular, the circularity of your image or uh, how close is it to being a circle. Uh, display label is a useful one. So if you've got lots of images open and you want to make sure that the number you get in the results table matches or came from the right window or the right channel, you can do that. Um, through to some unique ones like the ferret diameter. So the ferret diameter is the longest possible line within your selection. That can be quite useful. Uh, you can read all about these on the Fiji website. Importantly, measurements will use your scale, so make sure it's correct. Okay, so if we have our very generic cell image and we wanted to get, say, the rough area of the nucleus, we could draw a circle around it or an ellipse around it and then measure that area. And it would tell you that the area was this many pixels, 584. Tells you the mean intensity. Now, importantly, this mean intensity would be based on the channel that I had selected. Um, I've got the min and max as well. Now, if I was to draw a line across the nucleus and the whole cell, I would get a few extra contextual options. So I'd get the angle and the length of the line. I'm not going to get the length of a circle or the angle of a circle. So it will add some measurements that you don't get to turn on and off. It just does them automatically. Um, but once I've drawn my selection to get this measurement, I go analyze measure or command or control M and you get these numbers. This is just a table that you can then export to Excel or Prism or whatever program of choice if you want to do some kind of further quantification. So if you were to draw the area around 10 nuclei from the 10 cells, and then you wanted to get the mean of that, those areas, you could export that and calculate it elsewhere. So in exercise seven, we've got some generic kidney images. And this one, uh, we've got a few different images and they're at different magnifications. Now they have scale. So you should be able to find the same object in two different images 
So one might be like a 10 times and a 20 times. And then if you draw that around them, measure the area, it should be the same or very close to being the same, um, even though they're different sizes on your screen because of the magnification. So I tried to come up with the most generic exercise here. So you could do the area of one of the nodes. So you could draw like around one of these objects and find it in different images or across a line across a nuclei and measure it. It doesn't really matter, but you want to get roughly the same value from two different images from the same object in them, even though they're at different magnifications. Okay, so we've got two images, two different magnifications. I'm going to get my polygon selection tool and find an object in both images. So I'm going to take this one, draw. Loosely around it and go Analyze set measurements. Yes, I'm measuring the area, mean, excellent. And I've got that display label on. So if I go now, analyze measure, it's popped it in for me. And I'm going to come across to this image and find that same little thing is here. I need to zoom in. And then I'm going to measure that one. Now, hopefully, you can appreciate that the 20 times and the 40 times have um, pretty similar areas. It's going to vary based on my ability to draw the same around it, but it's pretty similar. You could do the same by drawing a line measuring that line of that bottom nuclei, moving in. And again, looking at the length, they're pretty similar. So that's as easy as it is to measure something. If it's just a case of area or length or something, you can draw a selection manually and you can measure it. So if I was to draw a measure the intensity of this nuclei, I want to make sure I'm on the blue channel, draw my selection, and then I've got a mean intensity value. It's as simple as that. Okay, so this one, uh, the answers for the line. So I did uh, nuclei and nodes, draw the circle, line, set measurements. It, you know, pretty straightforward. Likewise, uh, you could measure the perimeter. So if you wanted to draw that very tight line around the edge and then select perimeter as one of the menus, you could do that. Right. Another really useful tool uh, in Fiji is the ability to do a plot profile or a line scan. Now these are really powerful ways to show uh, intensity changes or co-localization uh, for your objects. And it can also be used for resolution. So all what a line scan is, is it shows you the pixel intensities along a line that you've drawn. Um, where it peaks is the maxima. So this is your intensity value. So as we go across this line here, we've got some background, and then we hit the boundary of the cell, which has this red label, we get a big spike of red. And then as we move through the middle of the cell, there's no real red in the nucleus area. So it drops down to zero. But in that same area in the blue channel, 
there's lots of DAPI label, but there isn't at the periphery. So does that make sense for that? Um, you can make a thicker line by double clicking on the line menu and then telling it that my line thickness is two or three, and then it will average it for you and kind of smooth out any of these peaks and gives you a bit, bit easier to deal with. Um, it's also important to remember that the angle or the position you draw the line. So if you were to click right to left, then it would be flipped. So a good tip, like with the re-slice, always draw your lines from left to right. You can also click the live button and then it will update continually as you adjust and move the uh, slide around. And you can hit list and that gives you all the values that you can then go and take to um, Excel or something else or export as CSV files to do processing on. But you can use the profile or line scan to calculate something called the full width half maximum. And this is a term that we use for calculating resolution. So if we have an object and we draw that line scan over it, you'll see that there's this big peak. And at half the peak, the width here is what we would call the resolved, uh, the resolution calculation. So this is a point spread function, uh, but this is important for something like STED. So we have a STED microscope and you might wanna make sure that it's working or behaving properly. So you could measure the full width half maxima in the confocal image where it's kind of blurry and in the really nice super rare dissolved image. Um, and you'd see that change, the peak getting narrower and therefore more resolution. So that picture on the previous slide is the, the pamphlet photo from Leica. This is an actual example image from the STED system. Um, this is a neuron cell and you have the cytoskeleton. So if you find, if you open up the image and you find somewhere in it that's you know a small structure, uh, the resolution of the, this big bit in the middle won't really change. But the individual actin fibers should go from being something quite fat to a very narrow resolved structure. And you can work out what the resolution is and uh, make sure that everything's working and behaving properly. So importantly, the scale, I think I skipped over this, the scale of graph windows in Fiji is accurate. So if you draw a line scan and see here where it says this is zero, one micron, two micron, three microns. If I was to click and draw a line from here to here and measure it, it would be one micron because that's the distance. So graphs in Fiji have scale, which is a really nice thing. So let's have a go at this exercise. So when you open up uh, the STED images, the first image is the confocal. The second channel is the STED example. So if we find, say, this fiber down here, select our line tool, draw it across, and go analyze plot profile. Now, if I go live, as I go from one to the other, you can see straight away that the peak gets narrower. So if I go on the confocal one, the height here is 12,000, so it's 6,000. I draw a line, and then I measure that line. It's 237. That worked out well. That's about the Abe limit that we discussed earlier. Now, if I go to the confocal image and the peak there is about 720, so if we go about 360, 
we can draw a line, measure that one. We've almost doubled our resolution when we use STED. Now, obviously it depends on the structure of things that you're looking at, whether you get that true 30 nanometers, um, but you can see that we get that measurement and the power of being able to draw lines and measure things on Fiji graphs. Now, if I was to list the values, I get all of these X coordinates and Y coordinates that I can take to a third party graphing program. If I wanted to show the co-localization of two things. Okay. Again, there's an answer slide. Uh, I did that one on a slightly different spot of that line. You can see that you get this increase. And then the benefit of the stead is you get this uh, where we couldn't see that there was four different structures. Now you can in the higher resolved image. Okay, let's say you've drawn uh, a selection around a cell and you want to store that as a region of interest to take measurements on later, or perhaps you need to take the same size drawn object from one image to another. You can use the ROI manager to generate and store the R uh, regions. So when you go analyze tools ROI manager, you get this little pop up. Now, if you draw the selections, so you manually trace around five cells, you can add each one by hitting add or command T, control T, or just T on its own, we'll add it into a list here. Um, you can update the thing. So if you select one of the objects in the list and then you retrace around the cell, you can update it. You can delete them, rename them. Importantly, you can measure. So if you had 10 things in here, you can select one of the objects and then measure it, or you can have all of them selected and measure all of them. Under the more button, you can save them. So that's really useful because you could, um, you know, if you've traced around all these cells and you want to go back and do other things with those traced measurements, then storing it will save you a lot of time. Uh, you can also do a thing called multi-measure. So if you've got something over time, you can then tell it to just automatically go and measure every time point and spit it all out into the results window for you. You don't have to manually add things to the ROI manager either. You can use uh, thresholding to generate segmentations that you then analyze and say, I want everything within this range and it will store them in here automatically for you. And so that's a topic of a more advanced workshop. Um, but do know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. You don't have to manually draw around everything. You can get the program to find all those cells or all those bacteria automatically, and then you can go and do measurements on them automatically as well. That makes it more robust and it makes it more time saving. And last but not least, there is the option to draw overlays. So we spoke about overlays with the scale bar, but these are like another channel or layer sitting on top of your image. And you can use it for annotations. So you can draw little arrows, you can draw boxes, you can, if you manually drawn or created selections in the ROI manager, you can import them into the overlay tool uh, and then it can display them on your images. Personally, I don't really like the use of overlays in the images. You run the risk of flattening them in and burning them into the, ob into the image and then you can't get them back out. So you should always be doing overlays on a copy of your image. And um, it also means that if you want to highlight a different region later on and you've done a million processing steps up to that point, you can't get rid of it. So always use a copy, but yeah, I personally prefer to do a lot of these annotations in third party software like Illustrator or PowerPoint, but that is an option in Fiji uh, to do it in there as well. And that's the end. So now you should know, be confident with the program, how to open stuff, uh, do some basic steps to adjust things and know that you're doing it the kind of right, tried and true way. And um, 
that you're meeting all of the rules for our funding bodies and things like that. So if you have any questions, you can ask them now. You can shoot me an email at the end. 